Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, if you're fascinated by space like I am, then you've probably seen hundreds, if not thousands, of iconic pictures of, well, celestial bodies, parts of our solar system. And thanks to NASA, ESA, and various other space agencies, we've basically sent space probes to every major body in the solar system, and we've managed to get close-up views of everything. It's easy to see the amazing images that are produced by the spacecraft's hardware and then see the trajectory of something like Voyager 1 flying through the Saturn system and think that, yeah, you could just fly along like this in a spacecraft, maybe poke your camera out a window and get some amazing pictures. Well, okay, you could get amazing pictures, but the amazing pictures you would get would not be the same as the iconic photographs we all know and love. Take this series of images from the epic camera on the Discover spacecraft, showing the moon passing in front of the Earth. Discover is a spacecraft which sits out at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, and is therefore able to see the sunlit side of the Earth always. And indeed, sometimes the moon ends up in the same field of view. But that Lagrange point is about a million miles from Earth, and at that distance... Earth is actually pretty tiny. The field of view of the epic camera is minuscule. The field of view of your typical everyday camera that you would find in a smartphone is about 60 degrees. And if you were sitting out at the Lagrange point, this is more or less what you would see if you could put both things in the same field of view. This is using Eyes on the Solar System, which is a package, a free software package released by Jet Propulsion Laboratory that lets you look at all the different spacecraft. The spe camera on board the Discover spacecraft is called EPIC, and it has a field of view of less than one degree. And of course, that field of view is optimized because it is designed to look at the Earth and very little else. And that's generally representative of most camera systems on spacecraft. They're designed as scientific instruments, and while they have flown all this way, they want to get a little closer using a, a telescope on a spacecraft. Now here's that famous image of Pluto taken by New Horizons. This is the best illuminated disk they have, and you can see, of course, the giant heart-shaped Sputnik planum. And again, you might imagine if you were some space tourist flying along with New Horizons, you might be able to get these pictures using your whatever camera you had laying around. Well, here's my best attempt at the reproduction of that image. It's synchronized to the time. And you'll see that our distance to Pluto is actually 284,000 miles. This was nine hours before close approach. And the image was taken with an instrument called LORI. That's the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. And let's face it, it doesn't get much more long range than Pluto. But you can also see at that moment of perfect sunlight where the entirety of Pluto's disk was visible, there were pretty much pinpricks on the sky. Now, one of the cool features of Eyes of the Solar System is that if the spacecraft has the data available, you can actually watch how the instruments were used during the flypast. And this is available for New Horizons. So you can see the spacecraft rotating so that it can point the instruments, Ralph, Laurie, and Alice, so that it could collect the data that was needed at the right times. Now again, I want to remind you that this 60 degree field of view is pretty close to what you would get if you happen to be out there with an iPhone. I know you would have a hard time getting service, but uh, you might be able to take some pictures and then download them the next time you got home. Anyway, as it happened, during closest approach, you could probably get a reasonable picture of this thing if you tried. But you couldn't get that amazing fully illuminated disk because at the point of closest approach, only half of the dwarf planet is illuminated by the sun and the, the rest is dark. This is one of my favourite photographs of Saturn. It was taken after the encounter and, you know, you get to see some of the ring structure, but you see the shadow on the rings and you get to see even some reflection of the ring brightness on the planet. Well, you know, that this is what the configuration actually looked like on the at the time that image was taken. The image capture technology that we used on the Voyager probes was something called a Vidicon tube. What that is, is you have a light comes in and it hits a sensor and generates electrons. And then because the sensor is non-conductive, the electrons just sit there. 
Later, you then run an electron beam over that and it pulls the, the electrons off the surface and you can read out how much uh, stored charge there was. Nowadays, obviously, they use CCDs or CMOS sensors. Uh, but most importantly, between the two classes or the two eras of spacecraft, the actual camera optics haven't changed a great deal. Voyager 1 wouldn't go on to encounter Neptune or Uranus, but it would be responsible for taking the, well, the very famous family portrait of the solar system. And this is the vantage point. This is the date where, the, where this was taken. Eyes on the solar system has quite a few options for some critical dates and stuff like that. So you can actually set this up and see where everything is supposed to be. Now, because the field of view of the camera was so small, of course, it had to take lots and lots of images and stitch them together. But of course, even knowing where everything is doesn't mean that you can actually detect them. Mars was too faint, Mercury was of course too close to the Sun, and Pluto, which was con still considered a major planet at this time, was just in the wrong place. And of course, Earth famously ended up in a diffraction sprite, sprite from the optics. Or as Carl Sagan loved to put it, a pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Of course, the one series of missions where we do have really good human-scale imagery is the Apollo program. The astronauts carried along with them several different kinds of cameras to document the process and, of course, to collect data. They carried 16mm movie cameras, the television cameras, 70mm medium format Hasselblad cameras with interchangeable lenses like this one that would sit in the command module, or this lunar surface data camera which also included the calibration plate, that's the thing that creates little crosses all over the images. They had interchangeable lenses in some cases, and in the final Apollo 17 mission they actually carried along a regular Nikon 35mm camera. And these Nikon images sort of represent the most normal, everyday images you might get from uh, another world. The different focal lengths represent different zooms, but for, in images from the Moon there is one thing of a consistent size, the Earth. This image of the lunar module returning from the lunar surface is probably the world's first everyone elsey. That is, a photo which contains everybody except the person taking the image. Here's one of a handful of images of the Earth from the Moon's surface. It wasn't photographed normally from the Moon's surface because, of course, they were more interested in photographing the Moon. But one of the most famous images from the Apollo program was that of the Earth rising over the limb of the Moon while the spacecraft was in orbit. This image was captured during Apollo 8. At the time, they had been taking images of the lunar surface using the Hasselblad cameras. The camera they were using had a 250mm lens, which meant that it had quite a narrow field of view. If you just pointed a regular camera out the window with its wide field of view, this is what you would have seen instead. All these images that we have from the other spacecraft are very specialist instruments that were, have very, very high zoom levels. The hardware that was carried by the astronauts on the Apollo program is much more human level. And indeed, the experience of taking this photo was a very human experience. And thanks to, of course, NASA's archives, they've reconstructed this uh, sequence. Yeah, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Hey, don't take that. It's not scheduled. <laughs> you got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh will you? man, that's crazy. Where is it? Quick. The opportunity took them by surprise. They were taking pictures of the lunar surface at the time. It's out here. Just grab me a color. A color exterior. Yeah. Got one? Yeah, I'm looking for one. C-368. Anything, quick. Here. Okay. Yeah, I've got it right here. That's, let me get up just a lot clearer. Still, I got a phrase that's very clear right here. You got it? Yep. Take several. Take several of them. Here, give it to me. Wait a minute, let me just get the right setting here. Let's 
Calm down. Hey, calm down, Bubba. Well, oh, I got a radio. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. 250 at F11. I've landed on simulated moons you know, hundreds of times, but of course, the original moon landing video from Apollo 11 is something special. It was recorded on 16mm film running at 6 frames per second, and uh, the 10mm lens gave it a field of view of about 55 degrees, but because of the way it was mounted to the window, it does sit at a rotation of about 35 degrees to the horizon, so rotating it to the correct astronaut's eye view uh, well, you know, it does mean that you end up cropping chunks of the image. But other than the slow frame rate, the images and the field of view are kind of consistent what we with what you would expect from everyday photography equipment. See, this project started out uh, as an idea to take classic, you know, famous images from space history and try and redesign them, reframe them so that they would have the same look as if they were taken with an iPhone. But I very quickly realised that the field of view of most cameras mounted on spacecraft was so tiny, so minuscule, that what we would really be left with was a tiny, small disk of light suspended in a giant black background. And that's not because smartphone cameras are bad, it's because they're designed for you know, terrestrial views for the everyday things that we want to photograph, rather than the kind of things that mission designers need spacecraft to photograph. Thankfully, we have amazing tools like Eyes on the Solar System that lets us get a real handle on these spacecraft, what they could see and what they could do with their amazing instruments. But I will leave you with this little example of everyday astronomy you can do with a regular camera. What you do is in a camera where you can adjust the exposure, the ISO, the shutter speed and everything to get a consistent photo from one time to the next. Take a photo of the moon at the night and then in the middle of the day go out and take a photograph of the road. Now granted there's a lot of room for variation in the exact illumination of your targets. But the point is, you know, you can actually take these images and you can learn from them. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>